1983 marked Ghana's first major power crisis and the advent of the infamous phenomenon load shedding. Fifteen years later, in 1997, it happened again. And again, ten years later, in 2006. And again, five years later, in 2012. A worrying pattern for a country supposedly on the cusp of middle income status. Due to rapid urbanization and high economic growth, demand for power is growing at an estimated 10% per year, and the power sector cannot keep up. The simple fact is that we consume more than we generate. CEO of Gridco, Charles Darkun. Right now, with eating into the reserve that we have, the reserve margin has to be increased. We have to meet the international standard of around 20-25% reserve. Currently, we're under 10%, and that's why we get hurt. We need to keep up and be ahead of the demand. The Volta River Authority, VRA, has primary responsibility to generate power for Ghana. But there's an ever-increasing gap between supply and demand. What will it take to bridge that gap? We're here to speak to the chief executive of VRA, Kukwa Wachi. It's not a problem that ever gets solved. And it's not a problem that ever goes away if we don't do the right things. So load shedding is nowhere near becoming a thing of the past. People are always talking about how load shedding will end. Load shedding is going nowhere. That's not exactly true. How can that not be true if, if, over, if you are constantly producing less than the demand? If we don't fix the problem, we're, you're right. How do, we, how do we catch up? How do we more than catch up? How do, how we, do we build yeah. to the future? Yeah. And, and it, it does require a different paradigm. So you have to catch up and then you have to create reserve. Catching up is an expensive exercise, and key to government's plan was private sector investment. And in the late 90s, the reform process began. First came the Energy Commission and the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, or PURC, two independent bodies that would set tariffs and policies and promote competition in the industry. The unbundling of VRA came next, resulting in the creation of the Ghana Grid Company, Gridco. We're the backbone. In, in other words, the spine of the, um, the power network, because we, we take power from the producers and deliver it to the consumers across the country. So we have a network of transmission lines and substations which constitutes that backbone. And without it being in place working reliably, you know, power supply can be compromised. Since then, the nation's transmission network has seen significant investment. The question, though, is are these investments enough to make a significant difference to power delivery? Or are we just really tinkering with the system? We're overhauling the transmission in a very fundamental way. We're doing a number of things. One is to do a modernization program. In other words, scrap all the old equipment and bring in new ones. And for that, we received funding from the French. We've got about 35 million euros to modernize all the substations that were built in the time of Akusombo. That goes back to the 1965. We're also expanding the network because there's growth in demand and there are new, new locations to take power. So we're extending the network in many directions, deeper into the country, doubling lines so that there's additional capacity, so that uh, we can overquit power uh, to consumers uh, more reliably. And so the network is benefiting, and, and uh, we're seeing the signs of that. We've just completed uh, a brand new national control center, which is where we are now. It's using modern state of the art, probably the best in the world, and it's allowing our operators who man this station 24 hours a day to have immediate access to every one of our substations across the country. Although still incomplete, changes in the transmission system are impressive. Reliable and efficient service and a level playing field are critical to attracting independent power producers. And Sunon Asogli, a Chinese joint venture company, was the first to come. Powered by natural gas from the West African gas pipeline, this $200 million plant provides the national grid with a much needed 200 megawatts of power. A second phase in the pipeline will add a further 360 megawatts. Chairman Shao Li. The 360 megawatts here is something like 15 uh, uh, percent addition to the system. You can see this in you know, a uh, significant. What is your target? Is it is it how much power can you can you add? I can give you a, 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 a you know a roughly figure about our installation in China. You know from our you know mother company Shenzhen Energy Group, 
we having you know uh, 7,800 megawatts installation. So we are far away from that, that one. So we don't talk about the limitation here. So know. once if the market was working well, there is no limit to what you can There's produce. No That's limit. my point. There's no limit. So far, so good. But what actual progress have we made? In the five years since Gridco came into being, a mere 580 megawatts of power have been added to the grid. Hardly a promising start. Government has declared that it will double Ghana's power capacity from its current 2,400 megawatts to 5,000 megawatts by 2015, just two years from now. Given our performance so far, achieving that goal seems highly unlikely. So what's holding us back? The is quick while watching. You have to think. I mean, power is a very capital-intensive business. There's a chain. It starts with me in generation, moves to transmission, moves to distribution. All of those parts must be working. Um, I would say the financial sustainability of the utilities is a starting point. At the close of 2012, VRA was owed over $400 million by government and ECG. Carrying debts like these means the company is neither financially sustainable nor commercially viable, making meaningful expansion all but impossible. You need new investment, you need new capacity, and you need money to do that. And for you to have money, you need either the banks to want to give you the money or you want the government to give you the money. Somebody has to give you that money to invest. And if we don't have the money, we cannot build. Now look at national distributor, ECG, whose losses are astronomical. We as the distribution company, we purchase electricity from VRA, from other independent power producers. Like a Sogli. Like a Sogli. And through the transmission system, we receive it and distribute. Mm. And the losses that we are talking about is the difference between what we purchase and what we sell. Losses meaning what? Illegal connection, meaning that power yes. that people are taking, they don't pay for. Is that it? I want to understand no, that. No, no, there's another aspect where we bill, but people don't pay. This is oh, the you losses don't collect. We, cannot, you don't collect. we cannot account for. Illegal connections. Technical leakages in an antiquated system and unpaid bills put ECG's losses at a level no company can possibly sustain. Once again, government is the biggest defaulter. If a generator uh, generates 100 units and uh, ECG uh, collects only uh, the funds for 60 of those units, we have a problem. A problem that ripples throughout the sector. Not only does ECG not have the money for desperately needed investment in infrastructure, it also doesn't have the money to settle its debts, not just to VRA, but to the independent power producers too. Shaoli of Sunona Sogli. They are facing, you know, these payment challenges, so they delay the payment to us. Then we also delay our payment to the gas supplier. So that becomes a very worse in the situation in the system. So the weakest, the weakest link in the chain affects That's everybody. What do we call it? A deep triangle, triangle. It's very bad things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To ramp up Ghana's power capacity needs massive investment, and the money simply isn't there. Across board, the utilities agree, low tariffs are at the root of the problem. Consumers are paying too little for power. To be commercially viable, the utilities must at least be able to recover their costs through tariffs which should be regularly adjusted based on economic realities and reflect the cost of production. But they are not. Power pricing is a political issue and government is not prepared to handle the fallout of increased tariffs. Here in Ghana, tariffs have no bearing on cost recovery and the utilities are left to absorb the loss. The sector must cover its cost. Today we are not covering that cost, especially on the generation side. So if you were to put a power plant in here, and you don't cover that cost because the, the crude oil prices are volatile and affecting your, your ability to um, recover your cost against the tariff that you have, then you have a situation in which uh, private players are reluctant to invest in. Resolving the tariff issue is a major challenge. I think from the consumer side, there may be a perception that if quality were to improve, then they would be willing to pay more. And from the producer side, the perception is also that if we were to get more money, then we'll do better. better chicken sense. and egg. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg. It's hard to believe that as a country, we will get what we want if we behave this way.
because take this year. This year, I have bought three times as much crude oil as I did in 2011. My crude oil bill is almost $600 million. You spend what, $50 million a month buying crude? Pretty much. Last year, I spent $200 million. Do you get $50 million a month? Guess what my tariff is? My tariff is no different from it was last year than it is this year, but I've spent $600 million, three times as much as I did last year. But my tariff has not changed. My currency has depreciated by 20%. I have no gas coming in, but my tariff has remained exactly the that same. That is to set yourself up for political and economic failure. There, there's no way you can sustain such an institution if that's what we do. To bring operating costs down, VRA's thermal plants have been converted to run on gas, as opposed to oil. Ghana invested in the West African gas pipeline to supply power plants with natural gas from the Nigerian oil fields. But increasing domestic demand for gas in Nigeria has meant that supplies to Ghana have been erratic. But the final blow came towards the end of last year when a passing ship's anchor tore up the undersea pipeline offshore Togo and Ghana hasn't received an ounce of gas in six months. This has forced VRA to switch back to crude oil pushing costs through the roof. But at least they have the option. Sunun Asogli doesn't. Its plant has been designed to generate power solely from gas. And for the last six months, operations have been at a total standstill. I cannot do anything without a fuel. There's no fuel. The pulp cannot run. You've chosen to come here. Now look at you struggling with gas. Do you regret it? Are you, are you, are you disturbed by what's going on? You must be. You're here, but you can't. Uh, of course, you know, especially in the, uh, our investors in China, they are very fluctuated because they don't know what happened here because uh, this kind of situation never happened in our country. Okay. In case that there is a failure like that, uh, people all concentrate. No people will sleep. We will concentrate to solve the problem. You will fix it? Of course. With urgency. Yeah, we have uh, urgency. We have the target you know, very that's clear what's in the time here. schedule. But here, we don't say. Oh, I think there is no specific people can tell you what day the gas will come here. Yeah. There's no such kind of information to any people. So that must be frustrating for you? Of course, definitely. The performance of uh, the West African Gas Pipeline has been a bit disappointing. We had believed that it was going to solve a lot of our problems, but, uh, but, but it's, it has turned out that uh, we can't totally rely on it. That's why it's important that we have our own uh, source of gas over which we have total control. Dr. George Sipayanki of Ghana National Gas Company, a newly formed state institution that will process gas from our own Jubilee fields. The plant is currently in its first phase of construction, and when complete, will have the capacity to add much needed power to the national grid. But the question is when? The project is behind schedule and has suffered endless delays. You were hoping to have finished the first phase with the uh, core process in it in place by the end of December. So why? But what happened was that there was there were some delays in payments to the contractors, especially to the European uh, European American contractors, and so they were compelled to halt the procurement of long lead items. TDE, for instance, in Canada, which is doing, which is fabricating the gas processing plant, had to stop, because they were not being paid, had to stop the procurement of certain components so that we needed. that's what delayed the whole thing. That's what, that, that was what uh, delayed the whole thing. And also, the ship that is laying the, the pipes ought to also mobilize sometime uh, in September. And because the payments were not made, they couldn't mobilize until in November. But you speak about payment delays as though they are natural things to happen. Is that not poor management? It's not everything that is under our control. When government has to make some payments and the payments are not due or cannot be made, yeah. uh, we can be blamed for it. But I'm happy to say that that problem has been resolved and the Ministry of Finance is committed to ensuring that future payments are made without any, any default. Xiao Li, who personally witnessed China's economic reform, doesn't understand the lack of urgency. Our planning there is that, you know, economic planning is that, uh, you know, we should put the electricity business or industry ahead of other development. So you prioritized it. That's the point you're making. That's right. That that's you, it, you, it became so a priority. That's, that's right. For, for the national that, plan. That's right. So, so this issue of competing education, health and all that, yeah. you put power as number, number one. Uh, number Is that one. correct? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Because without its power, you can't do nothing.
The primary objective of the reforms was to attract private sector investment, but interest from independent power producers has been slow. Shaoli says it's because the market isn't yet ready for this development. I have to say that uh, according to our experience here, it's still you know, difficult to attract more you know, uh, independent power producers to, to the country. Because when you're talking about the pure market, it's competition should be there. But here that, uh, you know, uh, I think the mechanism to establish the competition is not there yet. So, I mean, there is no fear, you know, competition because of the institutions, the rules, they are not equal. The operating of a free market has to be governed by clear rules and regulations, and the relevant authorities have still to come up with these. The reforms are potentially far-reaching and the first of their kind in Africa, but until properly implemented, private sector investment is going nowhere. Given the critical need for additional power, Shaoli is once again surprised by delays that he says are totally unnecessary. The electricity industry is a very old industry in the world, more than 100 years. So why you cannot solve it? All these rules, all this regulation, technology are there. You have to just follow it. Charles Daku of Gridco. The prioritization is something that has to be taken a look at. And uh, obviously, and energy from my key. business, my perspective, energy should get a top priority, yeah. of course. Capital is very large, so you've got to get it right. Uh, it goes into every facet of life, and therefore, it affects the broad majority of the people, if not all the people. You know, Mr. Autry, everyone talks about privatization as a solution. You think about an extraordinary institution with such a track record over the years for BRE and so on. And yet, it would seem that there's a suggestion that you need private sector people to make this work. If we begin to open up the market and so on, uh, how does that affect BRE? Does that concern you? Will BRE sort of disappear to be the state-owned institution that is not as competent, not as efficient? Is that what we are saying again, that private people are the ones who can do this better? What happens when you have a monopoly is that you have no competition. You have no pressure to innovate, to renew yourself over the years. So just from a pure uh, environment, uh, a business environment, mm -hmm. the, the pressures to innovate and improve are not there. So if privatization is a proxy for competition, is a proxy for finding ways to uh, make a, an a institution more competitive, it is not a bad thing. First of all, there will be uh, you know, more than one producer. Okay. Right. So that, that, makes it, that makes it for... It's competitive. It, it, yeah, it brings for alternatives and, and, and some, some competition. Right. And secondly, uh, uh, um, the, the distribution companies can also be reformed in the way in which you know, some of their inefficiencies are removed. Uh, and, and that can happen when you have, again, you know, more than one entity handling you know, different parts of the, of the country. What you find these days are models where you have part private and part public. And you know, the, uh, the, these days PPP is a common word. But the models that work, I mean, beyond um, the completely state-owned institutions like EDF in mm. France, mm. Uh, you see in South America lately companies like Petrobras mm. or Electrobras. They are still majority owned by government. But there's private sector. But they, they are listed on international stock exchanges. What about VRA? How about that? I mean, you talked earlier about difficulties with finance and so on. Is that not perhaps a way to go? It, it is uh, very much a way to go. Yeah. Um, and I think it is something we, we hope we, we, we go down that path in the not too distant future. Because what it does is combines the, the heft of the public sector, if you like, with the competitive and innovative pressures of the private sector and uh, hopefully come up with a better solution. This, uh, William Hutton Mensah of ECG disagrees. There are companies in China who are state-owned and they are doing very well. Yeah, I want to believe that I think basically whether private or state-owned, there are certain attributes and certain ingredients a company should have. For example, and those manning those companies should be mindful of it and work at it. Is it not true that part of your problem is, is really with the, the quality of the people that run the institution? To some extent, yes. But so why what, don't you what, improve what we are, Yes, we are addressing it. What we've put in place is that we have a performance management system, which we are running now. And we are signing performance management contracts with uh, direct reports. But that's not the first time. Yes. This, 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 time, there for this a while. time is not going to be just 
uh, just talking about it. You and sack not people if they don't do it. Definitely, well. definitely. But you've and never sacked anybody so far. You, that's the trouble. People well, that we, don't do well we, are maintained. No, no, but we're going to do that, to send signals to everybody that this time man may miss to go by what he says. Don't hold your breath. Dr. Sipayanki of Ghana National Gas Company picks up the thread. You know, um, if you go to a lot of countries in the world, when it comes to oil and gas, they say it's have control. It's a strategic these are, asset. These are strategic national assets that must be used to develop. And benefit the people. And benefit the people. The people are crying for uh, power yes, daily. Yes, and you know what? Uh, people create the impression that state-owned enterprises Don't work. are not efficient. Is it the impression or is it the fact? Look at VRE. VRE some time ago was the most efficient, wealthier, uh, wealth, uh, was the wealthiest uh, uh, enterprise company in the country. It's no longer. But you see, days. but you see, when you get, but at times, uh, the the problem that you have is that you get politicians interfering with operations of institutions, and then that that creates the problem. You have various stakeholders to please or to satisfy and to meet their requirements, and of course, uh, from time to time, there can be conflicts in that uh, that uh, that requirement. But it's a matter of working a tightrope and you know balancing the various interests well. At the end of the day, I think the interests tend to converge because everyone wants quality supply and everyone wants it at a competitive price. I think uh, the more VRA operates as a financially self-sustainable, commercially viable, independent institution from government, the more successful it is likely to be. I think one of the issues we face, again, as a country, mm. is that we appear, we appear to take a short-term approach to what long-term issues are. Uh, I mean, I look at generation. No new project will take less than four years to build. Now, if every four years the government changes and changes its priorities, I, I will not get my projects built. So part of the problem is that over the years, in all honesty, intervention has been ad hoc. I mean, every now and then you have a bit of a crisis, you panic, you do something. Exactly. But strategically, you are not thinking through it properly. And, and, and some of that is because governments change. You know, that, that concept always fascinates me, that governments change every four years, and so what? Are there not things that are just supposed to be done for Ghana? There should be. There should be. Un unfortunately, um, we, we, we have held hostage some of our long-term plans, objectives, to the democratic process. There's no need for that. Um, you know, one, one sees other countries that have been a lot more successful, you know, the Malaysias of the world, the Singapores, you know, they have one uninterrupted government for 23 years, they get things done. Uninterrupted government, you're looking for a dictatorship? No, I think what I'm saying is that as, as a country, our political uh, parties, our stakeholders, yeah. must decide what those uh, projects, vision, uh, goals we have that are not partisan, provision of power, water, roads, education. And we must agree that whether you come in or I come in, these things must be done. And here's the, the plan towards that. And so until we do that, we have problems? Well, we will. What are your frustrations? I really wish we can do more because we have the human resource and uh, we should be able to match any, 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 any power sector in, in anywhere in the world. I mean, we're already good enough, uh, one of the best in Africa. And if we have those resources, if I have a frustration, it's because we are not getting the resources to do more than we can do, because I know we have the human capital to be able to do that. We should be ambitious and aim for the sky. But you've got to be able to do it, you know, because it's really one you've got thing to, plan it. to dream big. No, no. It's another thing to be able to yes. execute. You know, you've got to plan it with proper planning, take into account the resources, both the financial and human, that you require. You'll be able to, you know, achieve it. Look, if only... There is a will, there's a way. But the point is that we are content with a little right. idea that we get. I mean, look at the scale, the poverty of the scale of the yeah. vision now. Yeah. In 1950 or 1960, the first president built a power plant yes. that takes you almost up to 1,000 megawatts at a time that you consumed only 60. Just even look at that scale. And today that is we are sitting there absolutely. That is vision. I think the shame of it is that we have that example right here in our country to learn from. We must find a way to get back to that. Kwame Nkrumah moved heaven and, he and earth to make our Kosovo Dam a reality and in the face of overwhelming odds in some cases, but he had that singular vision to make that happen. Um, we, we don't seem to have that lately. Nothing says we can't have it again, but beyond vision, it takes a commitment to actually 
execute to that vision, which is almost harder than that vision because it requires uh, a sort of interlocking agencies that must work together and execute that vision. And I think that is the real challenge we have.